Um, okay, I'm ready to start if you are. Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom McQuan. I work at the Samsung Open Source Group. I'm based in London, England. Um, today, I'll be talking about EFL, uh, uh, UI Toolkit designed for the embedded world, which is essentially what I've been working on at Samsung for the last seven years and a few years before that uh, on my spare time. And this is it. And if you want, that's a link to the slides. So you, if you want to get them or QR codes, scan it real quickly if you want. If not, it's available on the website as well, on the ELC website. OK, let's begin. So first, let's start where we came from. So the Enlightenment project is very old, um, actually way older than I was involved. So, But it predates GNOME and KDE and all of those, or some of those. <laughs> so for example, I Maybe some of you remember back in the days before MetaCity, GNOME used Enlightenment as the window management. So it must be late GNOME. Um, so it was initially a window manager uh, for X, and then it got split into libraries. So it was designed for that. But after that, we made a general purpose for more application, more than just dialog menus or, and the rest of those, the requirements of a window manager. Um, so essentially it dates back, like the split part, to I think around 2000. Um, not sure exactly, again, before my time. And we targeted the embedded world since the beginning. So it's something, it's like a bit of a stretch of a, you know, of a, a statement, because I don't know how available or around embedded was back then. But what I mean by that, we always targeted low power, um, low performance, more constrained, devices, and one thing, another thing that actually I didn't write, that we always wanted to have bling on those. So we're known for being very blingy on very low resources. Um, so th that's where we came from, that's where we started. And nowadays, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. So this is how we look, I don't know, maybe people remember. It's like we had uh, shaped windows, and this is circa 2001, I mean, not the beginning, but as far back as I managed to find a screenshot. And we just were very funky and weird. Yeah, I actually, I prefer a more minimalist approach than this. And thankfully, that's what we are nowadays. Um, so we used in many places and by major industry players, surprise, Samsung as well. Um, we focus still on embedded devices. So that, again, that definition of embedded is still very much stretched, like in this conference, for example. So I would consider my one gigahertz um, smartwatch, which I don't have, but <laughs> um, conceptually as an embedded device. But also we have some, I don't remember exactly the name of the company, but one company did smart voltage meters that actually had um, one bit screen, so like black and white. I don't remember the res, but something ridiculously small and nothing, almost something like a very small device. So we ran on those, like the whole range. Um, we are a mix of LGPL 2.0 and BSD, and nowadays um, we link a lot of things together and we're gonna ama amalgamate, well, that's a tough one. So uh, amalgamate everything to into one binary uh, at some point. So it's gonna be even more tight and just become LGPL 2.0. Um, but that's still, I think, a good, good enough for like everyone, it's not GPL, so you can just use it in your uh, software. Um, so we have a three months release cycle that we have been doing for the last few years, which served us well because it added reliability and first of all for all the distributions who want to package us. So now we're packaged in more distributions and more up to date. And also it just made it easier for us to deliver quality software. So we have two months uh, of development and then one month of a freeze period uh, where we fix everything, hopefully fix nothing, but uh, you know. And we actually have now continuous integration, which is something, an area we were lacking on uh, for many years. And part of that, we also have used Coverity, so shout out to them for giving like free open source licenses. And um, it's like a static analysis. Uh, we used to use, I mean, I prefer, I would always choose the open solution over the proprietary one, but this really blows Clang uh, Analyzer out of the water, especially when we evaluated it, because back then Clang Analyzer didn't have state. Now there are like other projects that keep it. So you would have a false positive, you'd mark it as such, and then you'd get it again the next run, which was just ridiculous. Um, we do API and ABI checks. So you can be sure that we don't, we haven't removed any API, we haven't, we use the Linux Foundation tool for that. We haven't 
changed any enums, so you can be sure whatever you compiled will work, even if you just blindly, you don't need to recompile everything, which is very important for an ecosystem like Tizen, which I didn't mention. This is where Samsung uses the EFL. It's a mobile operating system. Um, so it's very important there because you don't want to force all of your app store to recompile everything every time you decide to do a minor update to, the, to your backend libraries. Um, and also we have zero compiler warnings with WOL, WXtra with both GCC and Clang. I mean, this changes. Sometimes we have one until one of us spots it, and then we have to zero again. And I think I find this one almost as important as uh, static analysis. I think that adds a lot of reassurance. We, I mean, every time I fix a warning, it's, it's actually it's usually a bug. Like it's really usually a bug just hidden or a bug waiting to be <coughs> happen. So it's really good to fix those and. I trust projects that have zero much better. Um, clicker still works. So just some, some statistics. So the latest version that came out, I think, a month ago, we had 105 unique contributors and 3,300 commits, which is, I mean, I know, like, I don't like, like, flashing around, like, commit counts as a metric, but it's still, it just shows there are contributors and there is active development still going on after all this time. And overall, we've had 50,000 commits by many, many, many contributors from all around the world. So it's still going strong. Um, so I mean, now you know a bit what it is, but let's see what it actually provides. So first of all, we have general purpose library. So we're C. We write in C, which is very common in the embedded world. So we, have, we need to give some tools to provide some tools. And since we're very performance and memory usage oriented, we also have some tools to help you save memory that we use ourselves. So the first one is string shares. So in string shares, what you do, instead, so we, we found out, well, like we analyzed all of our UI, and we saw we have the word OK or cancel, let's say 50 times in a screen. And that, for every button where it appears, it will appear on the button, on the widget. Like it will have a duplicated string everywhere. So what we, done, we, we did, we essentially, it's behind the scenes. It's a hash table that returns the same token all the time that's ref counted. And that, that alone saves a lot of memory because all the strings are shared. But more so, what it gives, which, which we use nowadays, um, it makes everything much faster because we don't need to do string comparisons anymore. We just do pointer comparisons. So if we want to go on a list and see which one is the same one internally, we just get a token and then compare the, string, compare the pointer instead of the string. Does that make sense? Perfect. So that really, I love this one. This is actually one of my, our favorites, uh, my favorites of ours. Um, so again, a general purpose library needs to have lists and arrays and everything that C lacks. And, but the problem is that so if you go to Computer Science 101 and you ask someone how, to, how do you implement a, a linked list, so it's going to be a bit worse than what I'm going to give. Like this is Computer Science 102 maybe. But uh, you're going to create a struct with like next, prev, last, I don't know, a pointer to the general, um, the general data. But the problem with that, that means that every node uh, in the list is going to be allocate. You're going to have two allocations, the data itself and um, the header. And that causes, first of all, fragmentation and also cache misses your walk and then you try to find it. It's hell, like trashing the cache. But also, um, it just you waste another pointer, you waste another, um, another like the header of malloc. So what we did, we have a, a way to tell you to embed the list into your structure, and you just put it first. It's a macro, and then it, that solves both problems. Uh, so those are inline lists, inline array. We have um, we have ways to do um, copy and write, uh, which we have use heavily inside. So. Again, in an object system, you think, think about like, in a, no, not an object system, in a UI, you have all of this UI, you have the window and you have this container and then this box and then this widgets and whatever. And all of them in th their core is the same widget. So they have the same structure, which is gen generic EFL object and then the generic EFL widget. So a lot of structure, a lot of information that is actually shared across everyone that is usually the same. So. In the same tree, you usually have everyone visible, everyone the same color, which is just don't apply any overlay color and be um, you know visible like non non uh, no not translucent sorry, so one opacity, um, 
So we just we found that it saved us a lot of memory, and we are very obsessed about seemingly unimportant memory. Like, so I went on a wild, wild chase. Actually, I wrote a nice blog post about it. Um, that to, to find, I think we had like dirty memory pages. So cause for every application we had, we wasted, I think, a few, maybe 100K, maybe even less, of just di dirty memory pages, so not even heap. Just like when you load, just waste a few. And I was, I think I spent like two days chasing that. Um, yeah, so that, that one is, we care about those things. And we have magic checks, so we just have um, an integer in the beginning of every structure that is important that we expose and that has a magic number. So if you dereference the wrong kind of pointer, we'll find it um, very early and hopefully we won't seg fault because the pointer would still be in a valid memory region, just different. And we have you know, all the basics, list, hash, red, black tree, uh, whatever. We have a lot of things, uh, Unicode. So there you go. So we also have a binary serialization library. So nowadays, even surprising this conference, uh, whenever you want to serialize something, it's XML or JSON for some reason. Um, but we still, first of all, we've been doing it for a while, but also we found and we benchmark that um, JSON is really not that fast. I mean, you have to parse strings, they're like spaces, it's not always compressed. They're like a lot of things, and also you need to validate. Um, so when you have a binary structure, it's really quick to just serialize the C mapping, which is almost always the same. I mean, if you're in the same Indianness, same everything, which is common, it's gonna be very fast. Um, but we also support decompiling and recompiling uh, from text. So it actually is the same for you as a user. So we do, and we also have a tool called VI Eat. Eat is the name of the library. So we open it directly in your editor and then you can uh, edit it and recompile it. So for everyone, for all intents and purposes, it feels like a textual representation, but it's passed ahead of time, validated ahead of time, and therefore it's much, much faster. And we can use memory map to load it. So for example, again, JSON equivalent, you'd have a base 64 encoded um, dump of data, which is the image. We just memmap the image, buff, like bitmap as it is. Uh, we support compressing and signing, so for whatever you need maybe. Um, on my clicker really stopped working. So we do UI. So as part of a UI library, you need some extra uh, fancy stuff like a main loop. Um, and also, when you have a main loop, you kinda, you're tempted uh, to add some more useful stuff like timers or animators in this case, which are timers that, uh, that are aligned to the refresh rate. So for example, you have a window on this screen which refreshes, uh, let's say, every 30, uh, 30 times a second. Um, so you'll only get the timer, that timer called that much time. So first of all, you don't need to know about the refresh rate of your device. Or even more, like this, device, this screen refreshes on a different rate than this one. So it just, we automatically know and expose it to the user. But also, it means that you will only do the calculations as you need them. So let's exa for example, we are very congested at the moment. So we're going to skip 20 frames, like it shouldn't happen, but the system is loaded. So the timer will only be called once before and once after the animator, while timers may have, depends on the definition of the timer, may be queued and then called all together afterwards because you expect, you know, you want to track the time that's fast. So it's different constraints. And this one is very useful for a graphical library and we use it everywhere, obviously. And we have, you know, thread pools for thread workers. So if you want to offload some things to a thread, and um, we can, if you're doing like a hacky thing, you can execute, you know, like system equivalent, and then you get um, the output, you monitor, and um, if it's still running, I did that. I don't remember what I did, actually. I used that, it's quite useful. Um, we integrate with other main loop implementations. So for example, you're using lib, whatever, that requires, uh, that relies on glib. We, we can integrate with glib, so you can use that loop and just use us. And we also have networking, IPC, everything you'd expect. We also, back to this, we also have a tool to automatically serialize this over the network. So if you define it already to be serialized to, to a file automatically, you get for free the serialization over the network as well, um, which is very useful. And again, handles Indianness, everything you may think. So yeah. Um, and this is, now we're getting to the graphical part, which is, I guess, why you guys came for. 
So we have a canvas and scene library. So a scene, uh, scene graph, sorry. So a scene graph is something that comes from the gaming uh, industry. So essentially what it does, we have a graph of, we have a tree of all the objects in the system and we only go where it's relevant and only work on those that are in the area of interest, not clipped outside, not positioned outside. So we actually, we ignore most of the scene if it's not relevant. So you can have a list and you can have a lot of the list outside of the, I mean we optimize that as well, but let's assume we have a lot of the list outside of the viewport. Those are not even treated, those are just ignored. So it makes everything much faster. And because we have all of the information, um, so the, the opposite of that would be direct rendering. So you just, you call every object and you just say, render now, and then it checks on itself. So because we do that, because we have all of the tree and all of the information, we can ignore a lot of things and we can only render when we are ready. So we don't have any flickering. You don't have any, oh, this is just like rendered, not rendered, why? You know, so it just, everything just looks good. And also we don't have any tiering because we do double or triple buffering, whatever you prefer. Um, what else we do? Oh yeah, we support OpenGL and we have Vulkan support on the way. And actually I'm not sure if Vulkan is ready. I think it's not ready yet, but if it's ready internally by, I don't know, I think maybe in Samsung. I have no idea. But anyhow, it's coming. And it really saves a lot because we have a lot of, you know, hacks to leverage OpenGL in essentially using what Vulkan provides. So it's really, it's going to be really <laughs> beneficial for us. And we also abstract away the engines. So I would, if I would develop an app for the phone, I would develop it on my computer, run it as normally. I could resize the window however I like because everything is scalable. And then when I'm ready, I'm just going to tell it, OK, run on the phone that actually uses Wayland. Or for example, we have a few apps. And then we, when we switch to Wayland, everything just works, including copy paste. Or another example, which is great, is when you're stuck without X, you can just run the terminal emulator in uh, the frame buffer with the uh, mouse support, copy and paste, everything you may want. Everything just works um, because the, the applications themselves are not aware of the engine behind. Um, so we also have the theme and layout library, which now that we have the, the basic canvas and scene graph, this is like really the heavy lifting. So we, what we do, we don't, so you want to create an, an app. You, you don't set the color of the button. We don't do those kind of things. What you do instead, you create a small theme file, uh, which in a very easy language, yeah, it's another language to learn, but you also have graphical tools to let you edit it. And, and then in that, that file, you can apply on buttons. So I mean, I'll show, actually, let's jump there. So for example, here, you have these buttons are the same as all of these buttons everywhere. And the scholar is the same as this scholar. It's the same widget, exactly the same everything, but just whoever wrote that application just changed the theme on those. And everything just works. So you can have like round buttons, you can have <coughs> whatever you want. And you see, like, it looks like a completely different application because you can literally do whatever you want. Um, so obviously, we use it everywhere. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you separate your design from your code. So normally, let's say you have an error message, an, like an error situation. So normally, you'd write some code that says, OK, set this you know, text to red because we're in errors. And this is not very useful if you plan on migrating your application to a one-bit screen afterwards um, that is only black and white because red doesn't mean anything. So what we do, we just send to the theme, we send it a message saying, we are now in alert mode. And you can change it to whatever you want. You can apply the color, or you can have like a dancing um, exclamation marks. You can do whatever you want, animations. Um, so in the example here, for example, when they play music, oh, it's not that screen. But when they play music, they have like a rotating disc instead of, uh, of only just a play button and, uh, and the pause button. Um, yeah, so essentially designers do design, developers do code. It makes the separation very easy. Um, and yeah, oh, as, as I said, it's scalable, uh, resizable, everything just uh, stretches and compresses, condenses. Um, so, okay, so what, so now you want to write an application, and I mentioned the widgets, so you actually need to use them. So we have a lot of widgets, actually a bit too many. We are in the process of removing some, and I'll touch that topic a bit later. But we have a lot to choose from, and all the ones you would expect 
but we're a bit more mobile oriented, so you wouldn't have like Excel style, um, you know, a lot of columns you can sort. We don't do those because it doesn't, like, we, we, again, we are embedded directed, so we don't, we don't focus, we don't waste our time on desktop stuff, although we have some people who do. So, um, we support internalization, ATS, ATSPI, so um, screen reading. Um, also, actually, I'm going to show a demo of that. So we support something called finger size. So everyone knows, or at least, okay, where is this? Uh, successful? Yes. Okay, can anyone see where is the button? This is the button? Okay. So, actually, let's start from somewhere else. So I'll jump to a topic just because it's easier. So we also support UI mirroring. So I'm originally from Israel, where we write from, we use Hebrew, which is right to left, but also I think a billion more people in the world use Arabic, which is also right to left. So when we detect your application is translated to the language, to one of those languages, we automatically migrate, uh, we automatically mirror the UI. Um, so everything just like swaps spaces. This one is hard, like it's not a widget, it's hard coded to be this way, so this way it doesn't flip. But ev Every of the widgets, all the widgets do. And it's really, I mean, I think Apple just added it now. It's very, it's very helpful and very, it's been like for wind, in Windows, it's been, I think, from Windows 95. So it's something that's, that users expect in those uh, countries and really helps with localization. Um, and now I'll show the finger size, back to that. So when you write, when you write application, okay, it doesn't work. My, uh, oh, there. It's actually not. Uh... So, when you write application, normally you think about scaling. You think, oh, my screen has a very high DPI. I can't see anything. I want to scale it a bit so now everything is twice as big. But in, in, like in a mobile environment, you also have a thing called finger size. So, I have semi slim finger, but some people have like really you know, heavy sausages, and some people have like very slender. And sometimes you use a desktop profile that only has like one pixel. Essentially, my mouse cursor has one pixel width. So we can change the hit area to be, did it change? I can't see. Oh, because it, wait, it's a different screen. Give me a sec. Yeah, we do it. Okay, so you do that, and then like all the hit areas are now much bigger um, and support like your fat fingers, um, which is independent from scaling because you may have very good eyesight, but fat fingers or the other way around. So it's very useful to be able to control those separately, and that's a user controlled. So this is, this is like a normal uh, configuration menu. So it's, it's, a user, it's a user control for your platform. And you can also obviously do scaling and just make everything bigger because you can't see, uh, which actually I should have started with because it would have been easier to see from here. Um, yes, yeah, so th th those two are very useful. Um, and also UI mirroring is also useful. But those two are very useful for users to control what they do. So I mean, I got into enlightenment from the Open Moco project. I don't know if, you, if anyone remembers that. It's like a, it was a, yeah. A phone back in the days, I thought it was very cool. It was like pre-iPhone, and I got one, and I really like I was enjoying it. But the problem is, all of my friends were texting me in Hebrew, so I couldn't read it. So I had to add Hebrew support and the graphical one, the graphical library in SHR, which is what I was using, was uh, the EFL. Um, yeah, so this is how I got to it, and there we really took. Everyone was playing all the time with this, with scale factor and uh, finger size because it, was like, you know, it wasn't a product. We just got it with the default values. Everyone tweaked them to their own, uh, their own needs. OK, so now we cover everything we've had until now. Um, but as I said, we are changing a few things. So this is actually my baby. I worked on it for the last, I don't know how long, a uh, few years. Um, so we wanted to have an object system. I mean, we have a widget and we do inheritance, and we always had that, and we always had some sort of inheritance. But I found it really lacking, and I saw a lot of code 
that was duplicated all around. Actually, let me jump two slides forward for a or three. Yeah. So we had um, we had like a lot of Elm button text set, Elm entry text set, Elm item text set. You have like a lot of duplications of the same function that was really just the same function. And it was really confusing for users to understand which function they should be calling on which widget. And so we needed a better object system. So we evaluated what there was. Um, actually, I gave a talk about why we didn't use GObject at Foster like a few years ago. And the uh, GObject uh, people agreed with me that actually the cons that we mentioned are relevant. So we, it's not just a random case of not invented here. This actually had some uh, valid points, valid reasons. Um, so, and also, we had a few object systems of our own inside. Um, so we merged them. And now we have just one object system to rule them all. And we, have, we use IDs instead of pointers. So as part of my work at Samsung, I've, been getting, I, I've gotten a lot of backtraces over the years. And all of them were, I mean, we have a main loop. So we, the main loop dispatches all the events. So we have the main loop, and then we have like an event dispatch, and then user code. And then like, that's the backtrace. So obviously, the EFL was in every backtrace, so I got a million, like I, got, I would get a lot of backtraces a day for every user error. And we started to realize that people maybe, I don't know, don't understand, just segfault more. Like, let's no, not put it like in nice words. So a lot of people write a lot of codes that segfaults. And we write it as well, but it's, it's very important to understand who's at fault if you were gonna work with a plat in a platform. So we added pointer in direction, which is the IDs, that what we do instead, it looks like a pointer, but it's not really a pointer. If you try to dereference it, it's gonna segfault. We do a lookup inside, and um, check it's the right type, the right thing we expect, this is how we resolve the function. So we added a lot of safety to know this is what you're expecting it to be. And this, first of all, we found a lot of bugs in the window manager, and that was calling the wrong functions and the wrong objects. Um, but also, this started saving us. Like now, I get many more, many less backtraces. Um, so that's good. Um, so we do. It's an object system. So we do classes. We do mixes. We do interfaces, like as you would expect. But we also do something called composite objects, which maybe is available elsewhere. I don't remember seeing it. I mean, maybe actually in Objective C you have it to an extent. So think about a car. Like let's go to again computer science 101. So a car is, let's say, inherits from a moving object, um, or whatever. So a moving object moves, but it doesn't necessarily have wheels or anything. So a car will add that to the class. But the car doesn't, it, it's, it, it's not a car that inherits from moving object and inherits from wheels and inherits from chairs. It actually composites all of those. So it, it says, I'm a car, I'm inherited from moving object, but also inside of me I have a few things. I'm not them, but I have them. So how it translates to code, um, in the code you call a function and we automatically know to, di to divert it to the wheel. So you can say, car, what is the color of your wheel? And it will return the, the, the value. And also you can say, wheel, what is the color of your wheel? And it will return the value. So that was really beneficial because we saved, we had a lot of widgets that composed they were composed of a lot of other widgets. So we, again, reduced, slashed a lot of code, a lot of duplication. I love this one. Um, we have a lot of safety and sanity checks all around. We do ref, ref counting, ref, weak reference counting, named xref, so named uh, reference counting. We do we have parents and children relationships. So we have a lot of mechanisms to ease the life cycle of, um, of everything. So for example, Another example we have, let's assume we have a bouncing ball, uh, like a bouncing ball animation. So back in the days, you would, we would write, like we would create an image and then we'll attach an animator that would just um, tick and we'll change the image, let's say every, whatever, every frame. But the problem that users and ourselves often encountered is that we would delete the image, but we would still have the timer alive uh, because we would forget to remove it. So we'd have a seg fault because it's trying to access the image uh, that does no longer exist. But now, you just make the timer, or the animator, a child of the image, and it will automatically be deleted. Um, so again, a lot of like, those things that are not really significant, but really help um, to create safe code. I mean, C, C is like, um, it's a battlefield. You have to always, like, always make sure to, you know, to, keep, uh, to keep it okay. Um, this is a new thing. I added it last week. 
Um, it's a nice trick. I'm actually going to write a blog post about that. It's, so what we do, we compile all of the, the object system twice, the library twice, once normally, and once with another define. That adds a lot of overhead, but a lot of safety checks as well. So it wouldn't be feasible to include it in, in the normal um, running thing. And like this is so deep inside of our uh, graphical toolkit that actually adding an if in some of those functions really like um, really introduced significant overhead. So think you have your ref. You ref every time you ref an object. Like adding an if to a, to a plus plus really like doubles the size of the function and it's again called all the time. So it really slowed everything down. So our solution was to use linker tricks, essentially LD preload, to load a different library that um, adds a lot of debug information and tracking. Um, we create everything on runtime. So if you have bindings, you can just manipulate whatever you want. Um, and we also thread safe, as you would expect. So now we, I, we created this object system. It was great, and everyone was happy, or some people were happy. Um, but the problem with that is now you have this overhead to define it. So we decided, which is something I'm usually against, but we decided in this case to create a, an API definition language, so essentially a domain-specific language for our APIs. And once you explore it a bit, you see it's actually quite a good idea because, we, first of all, we validate all of the API and the documentation beforehand. So we have documentation that references other, uh, like other APIs. We know in advance that it is OK and will be OK. And you say, oh, but Doxygen does it as well, whatever. But the problem with Doxygen doing that, first of all, that it's not part of the normal build path. So people do not build Doxygen all the time. And second of all, with Doxygen, it doesn't, you don't have like the highlighting. You don't have, like it's not, it's not core. So it doesn't have the same knowledge as we have about what's going on, dependencies, where is, what is crossed, what is used where. <laughs> Like, this library can depend on another library and define systems. Like, we found this, again, this sounds a lot like not invented here syndrome, but trust me, it actually really helps us. Um, and also, we needed more things. Um, so we decided we, we're not going to write bindings anymore. Like, we, we've had enough. Um, it's hard to, to do them. It's, it's, like, it's really hard to do everything and just like keep track and update changes, and then you miss. You, you know, miss a feature here. You need a lot of an army of people to update them. So we decided to do it automatically. But for that, we needed some extra information, like ownership. Who owns this object? I returned a string. Am I, are you supposed to free it? Am I supposed to free it? So this domain-specific language added a lot of um, annotation to all of our functions. Um, and as I said, we didn't want the boilerplate, so we generate the C uh, implementation and the headers automatically. So all of when you build EFL, it just roop, runs, generates everything, and then compiles. We generate bindings. So we don't have any fully working bindings now because we haven't annotated all of our API. We've had you know, years of APIs that we need to annotate. But we have generators for Python, kind of, C++, and Lua um, that are there, but just leak a bit because we don't have all of this. And we also generate API documentation, which I'll get to in a second. So this is how the language looks like. Um, again, it's <coughs> sorry, it's a bit simpler than the C equivalent because we had to we had to limit ourselves to what is easily bindable. So, for example, we don't have function callbacks. We assume you use our callback mechanism, or use one of the other mechanism we do we allow you in order to add your own specific callbacks. So we have like a basic event system, but we don't allow you to add like other callbacks. Um, so we do, you import like extra types. So INA types is like the general purpose library. So you, you have lists and all of that. Um, structure, you just name is a string. This is how the, you know, how the, how do you call it? How the documentation looks like. True is like a built-in symbol. Like, so it looked monospace when we generate it. Um, this is a reference to an EFL class. So we have, oh, this is the class, inherits, inherits, mix in. But we also have properties. So in C, it will look like just it will generate two functions, so parent set and parent get. But in Python, for example, we can use the native properties of the function. So this also means that our API now looks better in other languages, which is very useful. Um, yeah, you can see some ownership, and you can see this one is allowed to be null. 
um, yeah, this is how it looks like. So we got so we organized like a few namespaces and the inheritance tree in general. We renamed so we had as we saw Ina, Eat, Evas, like a lot of like random names that don't mean doesn't do not mean any, any anything to anyone. So had I given this talk like four years ago, I would have shown you like a big slide of like the hierarchy of all of our libraries. So this is it, and I'll teach you ten different names. Now we don't do that anymore. We just have efl.ui, efl. Dot, oh god, uh, text. You fill all of those, and you just in a very organized and clean namespace. Um, almost everything is an object. So we have, as I said, timers. We have, God, oh, network um, connections. We have a lot of things, or promises we have nowadays that are objects. And as I showed you earlier, we just have one function to use everywhere. And we also took the opportunity, because we are rewriting all of the API to um, fix some design mistakes. And now I'll jump like way to the beginning. So when I promise you we have stable ABI and API, this promise still holds. We'll still expose all of the we still expose all of the old functions that behave the same way. So things haven't haven't changed. So if you wrote code a year ago, it will still work. Um, just like an important thing to note. And we also have the documentation system, as I mentioned. So we thought documentation is hard because no one want, pro, developers don't want to do it. And non-developers usually don't want to div, uh, dive deep into Git and start finding the functions in the headers and, you know, and add some information because all they wanted to write was a simple app. They don't really know, you know writing big, like, I don't know how many lines of code, C libraries. So we decided to do a, a wiki. Um, that, and we use DocuWiki, so it's Git backed. So we have a wiki which is partially read-only, partially read-write. So we generate all the read-only parts from the EO files, which are the domain-specific language. So you'll have all the documentation shown there and all the references automatically there. And then you have a section you can edit that adds more examples or more, I don't know, um, examples in C, examples in uh, JavaScript, examples in Python. So everything is generated by a, a certain convention that then we know uh, our templates and plugins in DockerWiki know how to, um, how to interpret. interpret so you can have it, you can, for, for example, you can only see Python examples. Um, so this one is a very good one. And if we have time in the end, I'll show an example of this one. OK, so now like, this, is what we, this is what we do. This is who we are. And, uh, and oh, we also have development tools to help you develop. So we have Clouseau, which is a UI inspector. So it makes it very easy to um, to like inspect all of the UI elements that you have. You go and you just, um, you know, you look and this button is this size and this color. So it's really useful for debugging. It works with GDB, you can do it remotely. Uh, you set it, you, you can either set an environment variable or configuration. So this one is like a lifesaver. Um, and also you can save it, everything, uh, and load it later. So when I get bug reports nowadays, I just ask for a dump of this. And so I can look it up afterwards. Um, yeah, and, you know, pixel inspection, everything you'd expect. Um, we also have an ID. Um, it's still under development, but it does CMake and Clang integration, so it's, it's a nice environment if you're into that. I mean, I use Vim, so I don't really use it, but it's nice, people like it. Just worth a mention. And we also have, like, you know, a GUI builder, um, Edge, which is the theme library editor. We have a pixel perfect test suite to make sure your app hasn't changed where you didn't expect it to, or our library hasn't changed what we didn't expect it to. Yeah, I'm just like rushing a bit because uh, time is running out because we started a bit late. So um, EFL can fit into uh, eight megabyte or oh, megabytes on disk um, with static compilation, minimal de dependencies. If you want to get out, you're going to get rid of the GUI libraries as well for some reason because you want to render on your own into the canvas. You can do that, and then it's only one megabyte. But think megabyte. But think about it. You will need some resources. You'll probably get, you know, back into fatness area afterwards. So it doesn't really help that much. Um, we do software rendering. We do GPU rendering. Um, we use the GPU to its fullest extent if the drivers support it. So you'll do partial updates. We'll do whatever. We're very, I mean, not me, but a lot of us are very like graphic geeks. So um, we use like a lot of everything, all the extensions, all. The, Love graphics, essentially. Um, 
So I would have given you like how much RAM we use, but it really depends on the screen size because again, we are a graphic library, so if you have this big of an image, it differs from this big. But this is an example that a colleague of mine ran enlightenment to applicate to EFL applications on Arch Linux in a desktop profile, so like a fully bloated desktop. And this was the system, like so 300 megahertz, 48 megabyte of RAM, the system, not actual usage. And, and the display, and he says it runs well. Like this is like the most hearsay thing in the world, but still. Um, it actually it works in those kind of settings. Um, so I'm going to rush for this, but I'm just going to show you. So we run a lot of things. So back in, like we run on a Samsung watch and the newer Samsung watch, which actually has a circular screen. I mean, those are high power devices, but we do the open Moco, as I said, um, but also a new Samsung Z2. Um, we run on fridges. Uh, this one is cool, actually, because they, we did rotation in software, whoever did that, so that was actually, that small compu computation intensive, and it still ran okay on this 400 megahertz device. Um, massive refri fridge, and you know, more things like cameras, TVs, and um, like, this is a GPS alert thing for your car, so if you're speeding, it will pop an alert, like this thing. And a printer, yeah, ran on a printer, whatever. <laughs> and also, as I mentioned, the, like the voltage meter, I just don't have a picture of that one. And you know, we run, we, we have a lot of different applications for Tizen that were written using DFL. So actually, there are a lot of use cases that are covered. Um, so if you want to write an application, you probably someone wrote a similar UI or similar everything. Uh, so you're going to be sure it's going to be okay. Um, we have like, a photo thing. <laughs> And we have this. This is like what I've been waiting for. Um, so I don't know, have, have any, does any, anyone here know terminology? Show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, okay, six, seven. Yeah, so this is like a crazy terminal emulator that was created because we can, which is usually a bad reason to create things, but this one happened to be a good accident. And so it runs, of course, an X, Wayland, frame buffer, everything you may want. And although it's crazy, it actually has some cool features. So first of all, everything, can be themed. Let me just. Everything can be themed. So, everything you would expect thanks to our theming library can happen. Let me just. Oops. There you go. Um, so, let's do this. Oh, sure. Okay. So I just ls in the terminal, and I have thumbnails, which is very useful for someone like me who actually works with, th you know, with images all the time. And then, oh, there's a link. You know, there's, this is like the, uh, the, sorry. This is a thumbnail. I just click on it, and it you know, shows me like a pop-up of the thing. And it also works with a lot of other situations. So wait, before that, actually, I can, let's see if I can do it without. Font size, yeah, I can do that if I can see what I'm doing. Oh yeah, it's still on the, <laughs> with a massive uh, scaling factor we set earlier, so I don't know if, uh, yeah, I don't know if I can, ah, because I'm using a fixed size font, so like I can't resize it, I need to choose another one. Let's hope this one is good. Okay, it's gonna mean look super ugly, but let's. Uh... Oh God, yeah. Okay, that was a mistake. Um, okay, actually, let me just do this. Okay, I mean, okay, it doesn't really. We don't really need the font, to be honest, because um, we are not. Uh, Oh god, I just ruined everything I can't. Uh, yeah, now because like, everything is so big here. Um, okay, so let's assume, and for whatever reason, I want to set an image as my terminal background, and why doesn't it work? Okay, I don't know what, oh, yeah, I copied the wrong thing. So, I can set, like this is my background, yeah, it's not very useful, but I can also do, uh, this, which is more useful, I can tie. Wait. So I can also 
do LS, not just on images, but also. CCD instead of CD. Oh, shit. Thank you. There you go. Please. Yeah, no? Yeah, okay. You see, so I can also do it for videos. It's hard to see, but let's click on one, for example. And you'll have video rendering inside your terminal, uh, which also works remotely. I mean, you, you're laughing like, ah, who needs that? But actually, I use, uh, I use um, how do you call it, WeChat. Uh, so this is, I use IRC in my terminal. And then someone pastes a link every now and then to an image. I just inline view it. I don't need to leave my... Uh, Terminal, yeah. So this is like a full-blown thing, but you see, like you know, like popping out those uh, thing. Popping. Wait. There you go. Now it's better. Did I see it? Yeah. So I can also just like do a cat. So you do like all the videos in my uh, thing. This is like a video from Fostem. Um Like it all running in parallel. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah. And we, when you scroll it, it stops playback, as you can see, no more sound as you would expect from a terminal that plays videos. Um, yeah, and, and that's that. I mean, that's, that's a cool one. Uh, I think actually I recommend you use it. Um, OK, so let's just wrap it up real quick. So this is where you can find more information. Again, the slides are up online, and you, so you can just look there because we're running out of time. So do you have any questions? Like, we have time for one, I think. Yeah. So yes and no. So the, the, the reason is we have the domain-specific language, and that one is not EFL-based. Um, so you can use, if you generate, if you use the same language to de describe your project, yes, you can use it definitely. And you can also use it to create your own boilerplate. We have, but you have to write your own generator. So we have a general purpose library that passes this uh, format, but we have generators that generate uh, EFL-specific okay. information. OK? Yeah. Okay. Um, web browser efforts uh, when FL, and what is the best option for cross compiling? So, Yocto or uh, what kind of new system I can use to cross compile? I have no idea. Um, but, I mean, it's, for you know. It, systems. Yeah, yeah, but it, the thing is, I work on that part of it, you know, I don't, but we use it in Tizen and we use, I think, OBS, like the open source build system, I don't know. I, when I used to work it on, when I used to work uh, on Open Mocha, we used to use um, Open Embedded, which is now Yocto, so, I mean, that would still work. But I don't, you know, I don't, I don't live in the front line of that aspect, so I can't really give you, like, a good educated answer. I can give you, like, a five-year-old answer. So, ask someone else. Oh, IRC or whatever, like, we will. Yeah? There are some oh. Pardon? There are some layers maintained for, for Yocto. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he works on Tizen, so. What about uh, EU backend for Vala? For Vala? Yeah. So, yes and no. I mean, no, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we are open to that. Like, so we, I actually wanted to experiment with Rust the other day, and I was going to write one for Rust, but then I got like, okay, actually, I have better things to do, like finish the slides. But uh, yeah, but uh, other than that, we, we tried, we know we have a lot of languages references. So we have like some people do, I don't know how to pronounce that, but OCaml. Oh, yeah, we have so functional programming. We have um, C, we have C++, we have Python, we have Lua. So we have like, we had an assortment of languages that we, know, we knew we could work with. So we assume other things would work as well. But no, we don't. We don't and especially, you know, Vala is very g object -y. So I don't know how many things would actually translate nicely. I think there was a, at, some, at some point a, a template for, for uh, enlightenment. Yeah, because uh, Vala, Vala started back, back when, when when the open mocha days were like, so we started, actually I started doing Vala, some Vala work back then, um, but I don't, I don't recall, I don't remember anything, I don't know how the state, I don't know anything about it nowadays. Okay, I think we need to wrap it up, yeah, or we don't have any more time for more questions anyway, so. Cool, thank you very much for coming. Uh, yeah.